My name is Jason Bordoff. I'm a professor at Columbia School of International Public Affairs. I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy here. Uh, I'm very excited for our discussion this morning about the intersections between uh, our energy needs, uh, meeting global energy demand, and meeting our climate challenge, which are both incredibly uh, important and, uh, and challenging and overlap in some ways and might sometimes create tensions and conflict in some ways. Uh, uh, we're going to open this up. We're going to have uh, Nubua Tanaka speak first, then we'll have a panel discussion where I'll put some questions to people, then we'll open it up uh, to all of you for questions. Uh, for people watching online uh, via the live stream, you can also submit questions via Twitter uh, at our hashtag CGEP, Center Global Energy Policy, um, and uh, we'll take your questions that way uh, as well. And like with most of the Center events, this one will also, uh, when we're done, be available for download via iTunes uh, as a podcast and through our website. So for events you can't make, you can consume them after the fact uh, in that fashion. Um, I was really thrilled when I joined the Columbia faculty about a year and a half, two years ago now, after leaving uh, the Obama administration, uh, to have um, a really wonderful group of people join us as some of our core fellows. Uh, and one of those was Nabuo Tanaka, who was the former head of the International Energy Agency in Paris, uh, who uh, is now a fellow at the center, who's also a global associate uh, for energy security and sustainability at the Institute of Energy Economics in Japan, which does fantastic research on energy uh, economics, focused on the Japanese economy, but also uh, globally. Uh, Tanaka-san has decades of experience with energy and finance beginning in 1973 when he joined Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. He's worked for the Japanese Embassy in Washington, D.C., the OECD, uh, and was the executive director of the IEA from 2007 to 2011. And in his role as a fellow, works with us in a number of dimensions from his home in Tokyo, uh, but also spends time in residence here at Columbia in the fall semester and in the spring semester. So we're really delighted to have him here once again uh, and look forward to his uh, opening remarks and presentation this morning. And then we'll uh, get a discussion going about it. So please join me in welcoming Tanaka-san. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Jason. I really appreciate that uh, you provide me the opportunity to work for the center and as a distinguished fellow. Um, and uh, today, I'm talking about this environment or more climate change issues with energy, because uh, when I was the executive director of the IEA, the issue of energy is very much closely linked to the climate change issues. Uh, I developed with our staff in the IEA the so-called 450 ppm scenario, which is sustainable scenario of controlling the, uh, the temperature rise to the two degrees Celsius, and what the cost incurred for energy infrastructure with that. So this is a very interesting exercise. And since then, I keep on following what is happening in the COP uh, negotiations, what is happening in the energy sector. So I just try to uh, closely, uh, let's say, uh, quickly uh, see uh, what I found very interesting from many slides which IEA always produce. Uh, the, it, it, the first of the thing is that Energy demand happens not in OECD countries, but in, in, in Asia, emerging economies. China, India, ASEAN countries covers about 65% of the demand growth. And some other uh, Middle East or other countries will follow. But so this emerging economy needs energy for economic growth. This is a reality. So how can they do that sustainably? This is a big issue. And interestingly, Still, we will continue to be the fossil fuel economy in the future. So gas, this graph is the self-sufficiency or import dependency of oil and gas. Oil to the horizontal side and vertical in the gas. And very interestingly, thanks to the shale revolution, this is the importer side of oil. They are getting more and more dependent on import of gas and oil. Those are the exporters. Yes, Brazil will be the big exporter in the future, but we still depend on Middle East, very geopolitically fragile state, or Russia and other places. And United States will come to in the middle of that. So this is a very strong geopolitical advantage of the country, which may use its power for the sake of consumer or for sake of 
producer, depending on their position. So this is very interesting kind of nexus to think about the energy issues and environment at the same time. Because thanks to the shale revolution, US reduced CO2 emission in the recent years while maintaining the economic growth by switching from coal to gas. This is very unique, an advantage or privilege the United States has enjoyed and committed further 30% of reduction toward 2030 for the power sector of the CO2 emission. It cannot be done for other country. Yes, COP21 will meet um, next year in Paris, and there are speculation for pessimism and opt optimism. I share both optimism and pessimism. Optimism for the sake of member countries of COP, I think there will be agreement of some kind, because this time it is not the top-down approach of setting the big targets of reduction and, and allocating them to the different countries. And this kind of approach is aborted to some extent. But it's a more bottom-up pledge and review process in the future. So pledging is not that difficult. So some kind of agreement will be done. That is optimism. But on the other hand, negative on, on pessimism is that, that's, as this graph shows of IPCC's fifth assessment report, we don't have much time. And pledge, which could be done in Paris, is probably not ambitious enough to achieve this two degrees Celsius or 450 ppm scenario as such. But we have to move on, and energy sector must not be the problem, but it must be a part of the solution. That is my strong belief since I was doing in energy security issues and environment at the IEA. So how to do that? Eat energy technology perspective made it the two degrees Celsius scenario is a rather surprisingly ambitious scenario for energy deployment or infrastructure building. We need everything. We need CCS. We need to nuclear. We need renewables. So mainly three major challenges. That is, how can we expand the very costly renewable energy use for the future? And how can we use coal or carbon by together with CCS? So we have the uh, uh, Ethan Zindler from uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance to talk about renewables policy and developing countries. We, I ask uh, Klaus, Dr. Klaus Lackner to talk about CCS, a very new, interesting technologies. And another one is the third challenge is nuclear after Fukushima. As a Japanese, I'm very much concerned about where we are heading. So I will talk about what's the possible future of the nuclear in this juncture. So these three challenges. Yes, renewables going well, but it's costly. We need systemic thinking, system thinking. We need lots of, the, let's say, uh, accommodating this uh, volatile renewables. We need the system to accommodate this volatility in the grid. Yes, IEA says many things, storage, uh, demand side control, supply curtailment, uh, smart grid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Europe is trying to do that in one market. Germany can phase out nuclear because of that. Japan has a still problem of this grid connection, so utilities are declining to buy more renewables, even though the plant uh, is under planning and approved by METI. This issue is getting very political. Why utilities cannot buy more renewables? So there's a very interesting assessment of the IEA team in a case study in Japan. If the legacy cost, the legacy grid cost could be 40% more if utilities think that renewables are more kind of adversary to their business model. But if it is considered as a part of the solution and a friendly solution will decrease the cost, additional cost much more, that they say. So how can we make this kind of thing? Coal is option, yes, but unfortunately. It is a fuel for the future, but unfortunately. How can we make it happen with CCS? Developing countries need it. Asian economies need it, especially China. And India will be the largest importer of 
coal in the future. Very significant technological improvement of CCS is needed. And CCS, I'm always saying CCS is the litmus test of the seriousness of the climate change negotiators or technologists who could develop this. Some mechanism which Japan is promoting CDM, it, instead of CDM joint crediting mechanism, Japan is now doing a lot with uh, Asian developing countries to use cleaner coal technologies. Here comes another issue of nuclear. Finally, Japanese nuclear reactor may restart, but we need it much earlier. Yes, Abenomics has three arrows already, but fourth arrow is a nuclear restarting. Otherwise, we just waste free spent 40 billion US dollars a year. And this is not good for the Japanese economy as well as global economy. This is a Vaclav Sumil's very interesting chart about the transition, historical transition of the energy world. It will take, it could take 50, 60 years for any uh, energy source to be a majority or major source of energy. It could be the case of coal, oil, and natural gas is coming to at about 25% after 60 years of the use. Just modern uh, renewables come to the stage of the starting. Nuclear is interesting. Already 30 years ago, it reached 5% uh, threshold, but still stagnating around that similar level since then. How, why? Yeah, Sumil said to me, it, nuclear is a good failure. I asked why. He said, current light water reactor system is a problem. It is not really responding, addressing the issue of the nuclear power, such as safety, such as high-level waste, and such as the proliferation risk. So the first reactor development is necessary. That is what he said. I am trying to do the work for nuclear in the future in Japan after Fukushima by regaining the confidence with this new technology. Huge capacity increase of the uh, nuclear is necessary. IEA says we need 23 gigawatts of capacity addition yearly, every year, to achieve two degrees Celsius scenario from now to 2050. Can we build 23 big reactors from now without change of the paradigm? That is, I'm very much skeptical about. So we need new paradigm. Pandora's promise proposed very interesting new a reactor system called integral fast reactor and pyroprocessing, which I am now studying at the Center of Global Energy Policy with Jason and asking Jim Hansen of the uh, Environment Institute here in Colombia to help me to develop the interesting notion of sustainable future with nuclear power. We are trying to write a paper and uh, do a big uh, conference together, probably in the next spring. Right. And this is a very important step to move forward, convincing Japanese public back to the nuclear policy. I don't want to go too far. The cost savings is definitely there, but the cost of carbon will be as high as $140 per ton. Energy efficiency also very important. Energy independence of the US is achieved not only by shale oil, but energy efficiency with very stringent field standards. So I think uh, Ted Nordhaus can talk about this issue of efficiency and technology from the Breakthrough Institute. So this is all what I want to say. And I wish that uh, very interesting discussion can help to identify the issues of these three basic challenges and future of the discussion and negotiation of climate change and energy nectar. Thank you very much for coming today.
moving down, um, Klaus Lochner, many of you know, because he spent a long time here uh, at Columbia uh, and is still uh, affiliated here at Columbia. He recently became the director of the Center for Negative Carbon Emissions and professor at the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment uh, of the Ira Fulton School of Engineering in Arizona State University, which is a great title, except it doesn't have Columbia in it anymore, which is very <laughs> sad for all of us. Um, but as many of you know, uh, Klaus's research interests look very heavily um, at carbon capture in uh, many different forms, uh, from the air, carbon sequestration, carbon footprinting, uh, and other things. And so <clears throat> if we're going to understand what role that technology might play in meeting uh, the challenge, the mutual challenge of glo meeting global energy demand and reducing carbon emissions, there's few people uh, better able to speak to that than, uh, than, than Klaus. Um, next to him is Ethan Zindler. Ethan is uh, head of America's at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, which provides research and some of the best data you can find on understanding uh, clean energy sources, renewables, efficiency, and how uh, the data you need to understand the transformation of the um, energy uh, sector. Uh, and then we have Ted Nordhaus, who is, um, who, uh, is chairman and co-founder of the Breakthrough Institute, a think tank in California, also managing partner of um, American Environox uh, research and consulting firm. And uh, many of you know Ted, he writes widely on a range of energy and climate and uh, development issues in newspapers and books and in lots of other places. Um, so this is a pretty great group of uh, people that we have here to discuss this issue. And um, what I wanted to do is just sort of uh, start opening it up by giving people a chance to <clears throat> respond a little bit to what uh, new Buo said, and in particular, touch on uh, particular uh, technologies and how they view the potential for those technologies, where we are in the R&D behind them, the scale up, the deployment, uh, and what role and over what time frame and at what cost they might play a role in meeting the challenges that Nabuo described. And so maybe Klaus, I could start with you first, and if you could tell us a little bit about where you see, see what, what the different types of carbon capture technology are that you see out there, where they stand, uh, today uh, and over what time frame, how you see them playing out in terms of the role they're going to play. Thank you. Uh, I would let me begin by saying is we actually do need a lot of energy, and it's absolutely critical that we find resources which are big enough to solve this problem. And I've always been saying we need really three big sources. One is nuclear, <clears throat> because we clearly can scale that up to incredibly large scales. The second one is solar, uh, which has to still drive its costs down, but it is a virtually unlimited resource. And you can think of wind as a derivative of that, but I think wind by itself is actually not likely to be large enough to run the world, but solar is. Mm -hmm. And lastly, you have fossil carbon. It clearly will run out, but it will not run out in our century. And if you asked Napoleon to tell us how to de solve traffic, his engineers how to solve traffic problems, they couldn't have done it. So I don't what, can't really tell you how the energy system of the year 2200 looks. So I think, but if we want to use carbon, we need to have carbon capture and storage. Otherwise, we cannot use it. So I feel very strongly we have to place three very big bits and hope that at least one of them pans out. Because if we lose all three, we are in trouble. Now, my, my main focus has been on carbon capture and storage, and you can look at it for several reasons. One is I'm a pessimist, probably even more so than you, that we will actually hold the line at 450. I, I think we are already too late, and the IPCC report sort of says this. It says we need negative emissions. They believe that most of this could come from biomass growth, but I think one should be agnostic on this. We need to figure out how to take carbon back out of the environment because we already put too much out and the inertia in the system is large enough. We have no choice but to figure that out. That first and foremost means we need storage because if we don't have storage, we can't do it. And we wouldn't talk about 10 ppm. Uh, we certainly don't talk about 1,000 ppm because we didn't have that much yet. But 100 ppm is on the negotiating table. If Hansen is right and we have to go back to 350, then from 450 to 350 is, four, is 100 ppm. But we could also come from 550 back to 450. But 100 ppm is roughly 4 gigatons of carbon per ppm. Uh, that is more than we put out in the 20th century. So 
we will be large scale in storage, whether we like it or not. Right? This is not a question, uh, is it an acceptable method for the future? We already have, have waited too long, dawdled too much, and we, we are probably sitting on the order of 1,500 gigatons of CO2, which will have to find a home. So I think we have to pull up our sleeves and work this out. The second part we need, we need to have the ability to get the CO2 back out of the environment because it's already there. Right? So we therefore need capture technologies which are not just limited to power plants, but, but pull CO2 back directly from the air. That, by the way, gives us then also a direct connection to renewables because renewables need energy storage. <coughs> and what better way of doing that is than taking CO2 and water and convert it back into a fuel. If you have excess power in your solar, solar delivery at this moment, you can deploy it to make fuels which you can use in the transportation sector later. So there are all sorts of interesting tie-ins to do that. Ultimately, I think it's silly to assume that all of our capture would come from the air. Clearly, there are better ways of capturing if you're at a point source. So we have to work very hard on that. And I think we are probably wasting our time retrofitting old power plants because they were designed to be ch for cheap coal, and coal is not cheap anymore if you actually uh, have to deal with the CO2 at the back end. So we should look forward to how does the next generation of power plants look like, which can actually deal with its CO2 in a cost-effective manner, and then, then integrate this in one step at a time. So I, and we cannot leave natural gas out of the story because we, we easily say we reduce things 30%. Uh, that's great and fine, but we get come down to 50% reduction, and then we are stuck, and we have to go to zero, and ultimately we have to go below zero. And I think I'll shut up at this point. So and can you <laughs> just talk about where the technology stands today in terms of what the cost per ton is for at the power plant, for airborne um, capture from air? Um, where are we today? How far are we from? We, you're saying it has to be part of the solution. I, I, I think the, the capture at the power plant, we are talking a lot that it's way too expensive <coughs> and all of that. I think it is not particularly cost effective even if it gets cheap in a retrofit, but in a new plant, there's really no excuse that we couldn't do it. We have done it in Malaysia, in Indonesia. There are plants which do it because they want to sell the CO2. Mm. So the technology exists. Uh, we have to get it into the market, and that is hard. Uh, the and what's roughly that cost per the, 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 People argue it? whether it's $30 or $150, and it's a, it's a wide range, and I think in part there is a... Is a, is a is a disconnect in the discussion because some people talk about the first of the kind, which is of course very expensive, right? You will pay $100, $150 a ton to try this the first time. But if you build 100 plants, I guarantee you the last plant will not cost you $100 a ton. And the $30 per ton doesn't sound outrageously low. Uh, on air capture, we are still on the test laboratory scale. I would argue if you want a comparison, we are where, where wind was in 19. 60, right? Uh, which also means the technology is not well defined in its details. You can build all sorts of windmills. You can build all sorts of air capture devices. Uh, the APS came up with a study which said it's $600 a ton. Uh, we can beat this number quite easily because we have a much simpler technology now than they tested out. But we we figure we are well above $100, around $100, $250 a ton right now. But again, that would be first of a kind. I would point out, though, that the windmill since 1960 has dropped roughly 40-fold in price. So I'm really taking the point of view if the APS study at $600 is right and I'm allowed to divide by 30, that sounds like a really nice price, right? So it seems over time learning has to take hold and prices have to come down into a level where it's well below $100. I think on first principles, I can make the argument it will cost more than dealing with a power plant, but it's not outrageously much. If it's $30, it's 25 cents on the gallon. If it's $90, it's 75 cents on the gallon. And to get some of this learning going and bring the cost down in terms of beneficial reuse, like you know, in industrial use, uh, enhanced and oil recovery. Why is, is there some barrier? Why isn't more of that happening? A few years ago, we sort of, at least I heard that more, you know, Vino Kozla put a lot of money in this. There were idea there were a lot of these uses, and some of it's happening, but not as much as maybe we thought. It, 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 because it is hard to, to break into these markets too, right? And 
I mean, the, the sad truth is if, if you ask me what's the cheapest way of getting CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, I'll burn you some coal right there on the <laughs> spot, right? <laughs> Uh, it's not an environmentally good way of doing it, but that, that <coughs> shows you what the hurdles are to, to get into those games. But I, I think, yes, that's how you have to learn. And one of the things which is starting right now is a small company which is trying to use our particular approach of technology to feed CO2 to, to uh, actually uh, a duckweed, a, a, a plant. Right, which is growing in an enclosed environment, is protected from the environment, and therefore it doesn't get outcompeted by the street smart <laughs> bugs who live outside, but now needs to be fed CO2, which we can easily feed. So yes, and I, I would argue high value products is the first thing to do, and that could be enhanced oil recovery, that could be pharmaceuticals, and ultimately you can talk about making fuel that way. And so, last question, and then I'll ask Ted to come in on this question too, both on CCS but also more broadly, apply the question more broadly, which is to drive this forward, you know, if we had, you know, if uh, uh, someone from the economics department were here, they would say, put a price on carbon, uh, carbon tax, cap and trade, that gives you the price signal, the right incentive, and then the CCS you're talking about that is necessary start, you know, then the market has the right incentive to deploy it. Is that, what do we need to drive this and how much of this is, is major government spending programs, sort of national policy initiatives to drive and deploy this? Or is this something with sort of what people think of as a market-driven climate policy, we're going to see uh, adequate investment because you're t saying that we have, we may already be too late. We have very little time. We got to deploy this stuff really fast. What's it going to take to make this happen from a policy standpoint? Uh, I think a little of both. Uh, I was a strong advocate in the past of saying we just need a carbon price. If you asked me where to put it, I would say put it all the way upstream. If a ton of coal comes out of the ground, that carbon needs to be permitted right there. The picture, given that I'm thinking air capture, I had in mind, if you want to get a ton of carbon out of the ground, you better show me a certificate of sequestration that another ton of carbon has been put into the ground already. Uh, and you have to buy that certificate. I think. Either way, you have that startup problem, uh, which you see in renewables too, where there is an expectation that governments are starting to pay for that because initially it is too expensive. You have to buy it down. The problem is if you put a $30 price on carbon, you do all sorts of things, but you will not do CCS because it's too expensive, even though in the end it can be done for $30. So you have to figure out how do we start at 150 and drive the price down. I think you need a program which I would call buy back the carbon, and governments have to be involved in that. <coughs> and I think ultimately they can't get out of it because who is going to pay for the carbon we emitted 30 years ago right? if it's not a government? You can't stick it to a particular company. So, Ted, can you come in on this? In particular, the pol like, how do we think about the policy drivers? What's needed? And are we talking about the right things? These are the technologies we know of today, nuclear, CCS, uh, uh, renewables, you know, you're thinking about the kind of breakthrough technologies we need. Are we having the right conversation? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll make a couple of observations. The first, um, you know, I, I think that if you're going to do carbon capture and storage or air capture, you need, uh, whether it's an explicit or an implicit price on carbon, uh, one way or another, uh, obviously you're not going to do it unless there's um, some regulatory mandate. Um, and I, I'm kind of agnot. I, you know, economists will sort of run their models and tell me, you know, this is the most efficient way to do it. And first of all, I don't think we always do things in the most economically efficient way. We get them done the way we get them done. You know, on other past pollution control uh, technologies, um, uh, we've actually had a fair amount of success with just sort of straight up regulatory uh, mandates. Um, and in fact, uh, there's some evidence to suggest that at least early on, uh, certainly I think if you want to kind of evolve these CCS and um, uh, carbon capture technologies, um, uh, sort of more classic command and control uh, measures uh, may more effectively force those technologies um, and uh, get them to the point where uh, uh, various other regulatory measures can work. So, you know, I think if you look at the history of you know, both SO2 uh, and even things like um, uh, trading uh, systems for uh, leaded gasoline, a lot of the heavy lifting uh, and a lot of the technology forcing happened before the implementation of trading or pricing systems. Um, 
And so I, I think to, I would agree with Klaus that I think one way or another, if you just slap a price on carbon, what you get is sort of a variety of least cost mitigations. And what you don't get <laughs> is investment flowing to technologies that may cost a lot more today, but may ultimately either be necessary or ultimately over the long term, if you can drive them down the cost curve, have the potential to get a lot cheaper. You end up sort of stranding those technologies um, because they're not uh, sort of least cost in the short term. So on carbon capture and uh, actually really more broadly on technologies, I think that's the case. And then I think there's a, a, another, you know, I, I, was, I was happy to see Nobuo show uh, Vaclav uh, Smeal's uh, work and, and, and slides because Smeal and others focus a lot on this uh, sort of history of energy transitions that we've had. And I, I would just note, and it comes to some of the efficiency talk, stuff that uh, uh, has gotten us in some hot water um, over time, uh, which is, uh, you know, I think there is a mental, uh, there has been a sort of, not just a mental model, but a fairly well uh, laid out policy model about how you did climate mitigation and drive a, t a transition uh, to low carbon energy. And that is um, sort of a combination of raising en energy prices and <coughs> reducing demand. Um, through efficiency measures and through carbon pricing. And I think when you really look at the, the history of energy transitions, they're actually associated with exactly the opposite, falling energy costs and <coughs> rising energy demand, um, which actually sort of drives um, uh, um, energy technology innovation in a whole variety of ways. Um, and so I actually have no particular beef with various pricing strategies and policies as one tool among many to get where we need to go. Um, but I think sometimes uh, sort of pricing in particular uh, gets um, uh, overly fetishized, uh, shall we say, as sort of the single silver bullet that everything else is complementary to um, and uh, at best, if, if necessary at all. And, and I just don't really don't share that view. So, so let me just, as a follow-up on that, the, the, um, the idea that these transitions happen for reasons wholly other than policy, I was at a conference at MIT yesterday and someone put up a slide that had a cartoon from like 100 years ago with a bunch of whales toasting. Uh, I showed that slide two days ago. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, like it was whales toasting the, you know, uh, what was it, the discovery of oil or something right. like, and then, was, and then we stopped get using whales for oil and we found another way to uh, get oil and, and build a transportation industry uh, off of it. Um, or, you know, we used to use a typewriter and now I can do everything uh, on this. Um, that's true. We've seen those transformations happen with technology. It's also true that those happen because the alternative was so much better than the thing that came before it from a consumer perspective. I'm willing to pay for this because yeah. it provides me flexibility and, and it has in increases consumer uh, welfare relative to the product before. That's not necessarily true in the case of energy. You get in your car and you take it somewhere and whether it's gasoline or electricity or something else that powers it, may be important to some people, but many not. Uh, you turn the lights on, you want them to come on, you don't necessarily care where it comes from. So when we're in that world, do you think that is really possible, that we'll see these breakthrough technologies that just fundamentally work so much better from a consumer perspective that they take hold, absent government policy that forces you to internalize the social externalities, the cost of your consumption? Yeah, I would, I would, I would, well, I would observe a couple of things, that it's not absent policy, you know. So actually that iPhone is a product of decades and decades of public policy. Um, every technology in the iPhone, virtually every technology is a, you know, started as a DOD technology, um, what both, and, and not just DOD R&D, but really aggressive uh, procurement, um, really for decades procuring on the very cutting edge of, uh, of the sort of performance capabilities of microchips and GPS and all sorts of other technologies that are embedded and have been recombined in that phone. Um, uh, and I'd give another example, uh, you know, another classic example of public investment um, uh, uh, and policies that are a little different than how we think about it sort of just internalizing costs, which is the shale gas revolution, which, you know, was a product, again, of about 30, 40 years of very focused public uh, policy. It also um, uh, uh, was a product of about a 20-year uh, production tax credit. Um, and so, uh, um, and, you know, gas has a whole lot of advantages actually over coal. Um, and I think as you kind of sort of start to get out, I think we'll see a variety of ways in which, say, uh, nuclear, uh, solar, and in, in various contexts have real advantages over fossil energy. Uh, for instance, um, 
uh, you know, for desalination. Um, I think there's a whole variety of uh, contexts where actually um, rising energy use and new end uses actually may be associated with other environmental, um, uh, um, important environmental outcomes where energy becomes a substitute um, for uh, land, for water, for uh, a variety of other resource inputs. Um, so I think there are a bunch of uh, both potential new end uses and performance uh, benefits from cleaner energy beyond the fact that they don't emit, emit carbon. And then I think there are also a bunch of traditional drivers. Um, so for instance, I think the biggest thing that, uh, the, the most promising single thing that I would look at globally right now in terms of uh, developing uh, cleaner uh, energy technologies is China which in response much more so to its air pollution, conventional air pollution problems and climate change is really uh, uh, trying to figure out how it's going to power uh, its economy with cleaner energy sources. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of attention paid to a bunch of the renewable stuff that they're doing. But China's building nuclear as fast as they can. They are demonstrating next generation nuclear technologies right now um, and at a, at, at a scale and a, and a pace that, that is unlike anything else that's happening anywhere else in the world. Uh, they are really focusing on how to sort of crack the shale code uh, in the various shale plays uh, that China has. And some of those may be a little more complicated than what we've done here. but. I think ultimately they'll figure it out. Um, so then, again, another example of a, of a big driver, and it is policy driven, but not necessarily, um, you know, with uh, climate as the central uh, central driver of it. So, Ethan, can you come in on this? Are we talking about the right technologies? Where do you see the biggest kind of breakthroughs happening now in terms of where 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 costs are and the role for policy? Uh, well, first, thanks very much for hosting me today. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, and unfortunately, I, I don't have a degree. I do have a degree from this wonderful institution, but only in business, not from any <laughs> of the sciences. So take everything I say with somewhat of a grain of salt on the scientific side. But if I could, I actually want to come back on a couple quick things and then I'll give yeah. you a couple thoughts. First, on the um, on the CCS discussion, I think it's really interesting in thinking about, well, if you just put a price on carbon, could, would you then get CCS? I think it's important to note that the U.S. is in the process of de facto putting a price on carbon through two major regulations that are halfway towards being completed. And one of them, uh, which is I think is 111B, is on new construction of power plants in the U.S. And it basically says you can't build a coal plant in the U.S. unless it confines to some very high requirements for, reduce it for, for emissions. And basically, by our calculation, that means if you want to build new coal in the US, it's got to be equipped with CCS, or you're not building a new coal plant. So that's you know, step number one that's, that's already out there. Now, I would argue that that will not, on its own, generate a lot of CCS build, um, simply because people will do the low cost option for compliance, which is going to be to build a new gas plant instead of building a new coal plant, not building a new CCS equipped coal plant. So if you want CCS and if you want to support it longer term, it is more of a direct government investment in my view because you're looking 5 or 10 or 15 years out for the technology to truly come of age. Uh, and we have seen actually efforts of sort of public-private partnerships to try to fund projects. And even those have had some trouble over the last several years with some corporate players not necessarily wanting to participate for the longer run. It really does strike me as a government uh, challenge and issue, and I think if we are serious about the long-term issue around climate, it's probably one that government should step up and really own for the for the longer uh, term. I guess the second point you made about sort of uh, just a very minor point. I definitely agree that you know th that uh, power essentially essentially is undifferentiated it is a commodity. We get electrons are more or less the same. The only thing I would take slight issue is that I I own a, a Nissan Leaf, which is not even a Tesla. But uh, but that thing can like that can smoke a Porsche from uh, you know from zero to thirty. After that, though, forget it. But the acceleration <laughs> on it, <laughs> I'm just saying, it's a lot of fun to drive for anybody who hasn't driven an electric vehicle. It's a great it's a great innovation in my view. It really Porsche is, is fun too, but most people don't buy one. Exactly. <laughs> All I'm saying is you don't need to buy a Tesla to get a high performance electric vehicle. Um, but your point's still very well taken, which is at the end of the day, consumers, you know, an electron is an electron. We want to turn on the lights. We want to be able to generate power. My larger point, though, would be, and I think, I, think it's, I think it makes a ton of sense to think longer term about all of these technologies, but in the short run, we do have, basically, we do have zero carbon technologies that aren't perfect, but are here and now and really should be supported and invested in and are cost competitive. Certainly, um, nuclear is going to be part of the 
part of the uh, issue and part of the solution going forward. I think it's expensive, but if you look in the long term and the fact that it, that it serves baseload, it's, it's, it inevitably has to be part of dealing, taking a serious, having a serious conversation about climate change. The other thing, though, which we've done a lot of work on is on renewables. And the reality is that in many parts of the world, but certainly not all, um, renewable technologies are cost competitive now. Uh, if you look at the very high price of generating power and consuming power in some of the developing countries, if you're burning diesel, that ain't a great way to, you know, light your home. And you can displace that, if you're, particularly if you're in a sunny part of the world now, given that we've seen the cost of solar equipment drop by about three quarters in the last several years, you can now displace that with photovoltaics. Is that so just, is that absent government subsidies and support, or it competes in, on its own? Certainly or? in some parts of the world. I mean, just for instance, on Friday, Brazil held a, a tender for power contracts, uh, which was confined, yes, just to solar players. Um, but the price that came in was $87 per megawatt hour. That's what everybody bid in at, to build projects. They have to be online in three years, so that's, that's their presumed price for power delivery three years from now. But that's cheap in the global context of things. Uh, it's really pretty inexpensive. So if you look, and, and that's not, a, by the way, that's not a subsidized situation. That's 87 bucks is what you're going to get. Uh, and in fact, if anything, it's harder to do um, solar in Brazil because you got to, you know, there's certain rules that you got to build the, the panels in Brazil, which makes it more expensive. Um, so there are examples around the world. I mean, one of the things that we've done, we've done a big study recently funded by USAID and the UK government, Inter-American Development Bank. And we've been looking at 55 developing world countries. And, and the, the rate of progress and the rate of adoption of renewables in those countries on a percentage basis has been faster than in OECD countries. Of course, a big part of the story is China, a huge part of the story. Um, but if you look, you know, the countries that have the highest rates of economic growth, the highest rates of demand growth for electricity are also the countries that are adding renewables at the highest rates. And yes, there are policy supports in some of those countries, but let's be clear, these are not wealthy countries. They can't afford Germany-like or Italy-like subsidies for solar. They have to do it in a more comp cost competitive way, and they're getting it done so far. So I just want to make sure I understand the takeaway from that, because you hear that often, uh, that you know, renewables in many places compete, they're more economic than, than, than fossil fuels. Uh, and one could leave with the impression that, great, we're kind of headed toward a path where the low cost, the low carbon option is going to be the best one. And it's like we talked about before, it's going to just absent policy displace fossil fuels. Um, the reference projections we see from everywhere, the EIA, the IEA, everywhere else, which says absent a change in policy, yeah, renewables are going to grow a lot, but fossil fuels are, the growth is staggering and we are nowhere near headed in the right direction. Is that, are those right or are those missing something? I mean, in our view, you know, we have our own long-term view and we, we certainly view, we don't think fossil is going to disappear anytime soon. And you probably have about half the, the generation in the world by 2030 will still be accounted by fossil generation. There's no question about that. But we also do project renewables growing at a very healthy clip. But just to be clear mm. on what I'm saying, it's not that renewables are cost competitive everywhere. It's a, they're cost competitive in markets where you have high electricity prices or very good natural resource or some clear combination of both of those things. And that is a good part of the developing world. Klaus and then Ted, you wanted to come in Yeah, I, I, I see the same thing, if, 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 even on a, on a nearly private level. If I start putting solar panels on my house, I may not have anything at night, but that electricity, when I have it, is cheaper than the one I have. Right. So, so it's starting that way, and it, it will get into the system. On the other hand... Then you have to decide if you want to pay for the wires for electricity at night, but that's a different question. <laughs> right. And I think that's actually a downward spiral for the utilities, because I'll insist on having them, and I'm using less and less electricity. That's, that's what's going to happen. But, but, but I, I also think you will see competition coming back. One of the things sort of which shaped my thinking early on was the observation that between 85 and 95... Uh, coal prices were roughly cut in half. And the reason they did is they were fighting for their life against natural <laughs> gas. So we see the prices we see because nobody is there. Uh, if, you, if you start seeing solar or wind greatly undercutting that, uh, I think you will see prices in general coming down, which is not a bad thing, which is the second thing I would like to say. I think we make a mistake if we try to squeeze energy out, and I think we agree on that. Our goal has to be to use energy sensibly and have it affordably, and it can replace other things which are environmentally far more unhealthy. And so we should allow energy to be there 
rather than not, right? Uh, if we need to desalinate seawater, it's probably environmentally nicer than rerouting rivers over large distances. And, but we then have to pay the energy bill, and that, that is doable. But just to follow up to what you're saying, and then Ted, I want you to come in on this, but you, you, know, the, you were saying, see, look, in some form, capturing CO2 from a source of emission from the air just has to play a role if we're serious, because we already have so much baked in, we're already too far down the road. So if that technology is going to have to be used, I can imagine some people saying, Great, we don't have to get off fossil fuels. We got a ton of cheap fossil fuels. It's all over the place. The, you know, Earth's crust is chock a block full of hydrocarbons, and it's pretty cheap and pretty good at what it does, except for all these problems with what it emits in the air. Um, so, what, what, do we do we need to do we need to get off of fossil fuels, which is how many people think about the climate challenge? If you're saying carbon capture and storage in different forms is going to, in the end, be a, have to play a role, is, any, is, it, is the issue scale? So it's only going to take us so far. Or? See. I, I, th I think about it slightly differently in, in, in the way I would, I would admit up front, we may not need to get off fossil fuels if we do it right. Uh, on the other hand, do you want to put all your eggs in one basket, right? Uh, it may turn out that CCS is a lot harder than we think. We, we haven't really done it on a large scale. I think geological storage is probably far more limited than we think. I may be wrong on it. People have told me that we run out of oil forever, and we haven't, so maybe we won't <laughs> run out of CCS storage either, right? But, but we don't know the answer to this. I'm skeptical that it's as easy as we think, and I think we should hedge our bit by having several options which each individually is big enough to solve the problem. And so that's why I'm coming back. I want solar, I want nuclear, and I want carbon with CCS. Ted, can you, and then Tanaka san, after that, maybe yeah. you, it would be helpful to hear your response to kind of what you heard given the questions you posed at the beginning of this panel. Yeah, I, I was, um, I, I wanted to actually uh, kind of pick up on something that Ethan brought up. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm uh, not as quite, uh, I'm not quite the solar optimist <laughs> that Ethan is, um, although I, you know, I do think, uh, you know, solar continues to improve. I've got panels on my house. Um, uh, anyone who actually can tell me what the real implicit subsidy for those is when you factor in the rate structure and things like that, please let me know. Um, uh, uh, or I should say, you know, we could argue till the cows come home on what it really is um, based on what your assumptions of what's a subsidy and not are. But, but, um, uh, but I, I think there's an important thing, in the, and, and Ethan brought it up about China, and I was getting at it earlier, which is that it is rising demand that actually drives these energy transitions. Um, uh, and um, I think there's another corollary to that, which is if we, you want to think about where <clears throat> low carbon or, and just generally energy technology innovation is going to happen in the coming decades, I think there was an old model, you know, going back to like the Brundtland Commission and the early um, uh, climate negotiations, which was sort of technology transfer, which was that we were going to kind of develop all of these great technologies uh, in the West and then sort of beneficently hand them off uh, to developing economies around the world. And of course, it, it, when you really think about it, it makes no sense at all, because everything we know about innovation is that a huge amount of it happens where the infrastructure is being built, where the technology is being deployed. And if you think about it that way, then I think there's a strong case to be made that mo much of the innovation that we're going to see in low carbon technology in the coming decades is going to be happening where the infrastructure is being built. And that is in the developing world. It's in places like China and India and Brazil and ultimately Africa. And I think, you know, as we kind of really get our heads around the, 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 the just innovation imperative, um, that, that whichever set of suite of technologies you sort of think <coughs> will ultimately be the answer, they all are going to require a, a, a huge uh, continuing rates of innovation. I think we need to start to get our heads around um, what a sort of collaborative global innovation uh, agenda looks like that really, really tries to take advantage of the extraordinary build out of energy infrastructure that is going, is happening and is going to continue to be happening in the developing world over the next four or five decades. You know, I would just, I would just yeah, agree that, I, I, first, I never really understood what technology transfer actually meant. Um, second of all, once I thought I got my head around it, it made absolutely no sense within the context of a world in which people develop new ideas to make money off of them. Um, and then third, the concept that we need to transfer the technology to developing world, mm -hmm. i.e. 
countries like China is ludicrous at this point. <laughs> China is the number one manufacturer of wind turbines. They are the number one manufacturer of solar modules. And actually, they started doing that before they had a demand market locally. They were doing it to export it to Germany. So this kind of dichotomy that's been set up at the climate talks around that is absurd and I actually hope kind of disappears over the next 12 months as we get to uh, Paris. Nibor, do you... Um yeah. I'd be curious to hear your reactions to the conversation we've heard about Very where these technologies Very stand and where policy needs to play a role. Y yes, I think uh, it, it's not only policy can deliver the technology, innovation, cost, price, uh, uh, say, uh, sim uh, signals, all needed. But IA has long been discussing about uh, what is the proper policy uh, 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 for renewables. Um, because government policy, uh, there are four or five principles. One is that uh, the policy should be transparent. It should be clear for everybody, for anybody, that what government is trying to subsidize or support. Otherwise, we are in trouble. Transparency. Second is predictability. What would happen in, in the times come? So uh, when, uh, the, let's say, the support measures is ending, uh, how it's getting smaller and smaller. So this kind of predictability is another very important uh, nature. And the third and fourth is tricky. One is the stability of the policy, but the fourth is flexibility at the same time. So this is somewhat uh, tricky, but uh, it is true if it is if uh, very too stable or too rigid, it may create a huge problem. In, in, in Japan, set the very high feed-in tariffs for solar, and we have huge problem of rush and uh, <coughs> some kind of design was not proper. So uh, the government uh, provide lots of approvals for the plan of building solar power. Uh, <coughs> Uh, plants, but actually utilities decline to buy because there is no grid connections available to transfer the uh, electricity generated. So this is getting a political problem now. So this kind of uh, uh, situation needs some flexible uh, f change of the design of the system if the mistake is uh, was there. And finally, the fifth point of this, this government policy is very interesting. That is, yes, government support should clearly show when sunsetting happens, because it cannot go forever. So some kind of sunsetting of the, uh, of the support measures should be understood by all players. So these are the five rules. And having said that, uh, energy infrastructure in general uh, needs huge initial investment or initial cost. Uh, CCS, uh, renewables, nuclear, all same. So if government changes policies, depending on which party took the office or takes the office, this is a huge problem. So, you know, energy infrastructure, uh, if uh, we suppose to get private investment into the energy infrastructure, energy policy should not change as a political uh, issue. This is uh, most difficult, in fact, uh, the observation, which uh, IA has been long saying, but uh, not very well listened to, unfortunately. I don't know if US government is taking good examples or not, but... Uh, yes, we set very predictable, long-term, clear price signals through policy for industry to respond to. Uh, uh, but do you, I'm curious, just <clears throat> one thing you said. I mean, the, the, you had the idea to do this panel during the week you were spending here um, to talk about these twin challenges of meeting the climate challenge and meeting world, the world's growing uh, energy needs. Um, and we're talking about many technologies which are going to take time to emerge. Some are competitive today in some places, but not others. Um, and we also have the challenge not just of you know China's GDP growth rate, but 1.3 billion people without access to modern energy services. And we want to do uh, all we can to pull more and more people out of energy poverty. What role do you think... Uh, in the near to medium term, coal should play in that. And you know, when you think about the way how Poland engages in the EU and their view of the role coal needs to play in their economy, or the debate in the World Bank over loan support for Pakistan and a new coal plant there, for countries that really have trouble keeping the lights on, yeah. um, how should we think about yeah. the pros and cons of uh, allowing coal to meet that demand? Yes, this is a kind of a very important 
and very difficult issue. In, in energy security and energy, I mean, sustainability is in many cases the same thing. That's two sides of the same coin. Renewables can uh, be a sustainable policy, but at the same time, it decreases the use of uh, fossil fuel like oil and gas and creating energy <coughs> security. So the renewables, energy efficiency, nuclear, all the same, but except coal. Yes, coal is not sustainable because of this carbon or air pollution. So how can we make coal cleaner, at least, is probably the issue. So I think uh, we cannot stop, for example, India to use coal, because China has uh, grown uh, rapidly and very successfully using coal. Can we stop India to do the same? India is always saying, why can't we grow just like China did? And this is no way for any country to, uh, uh, India has a serious problem of energy poverty and access to the electricity. China has already graduated that level by coal power plant. So make India to use coal, but cleaner is probably the only answer. So kind of a CDM or bilateral Japan's proposal of crediting mechanism or financial tools or whatever to transfer the cleaner coal burning power plant, efficient burning power plant, maybe CCS technologies. You know, that kind of uh, global help is probably necessary to make India to be to participating and joining the uh, global consensus in, in Paris. Because probably most difficult player in getting a consensus in Paris is India. China is already slowing down its economy, so the targeting of reducing CO2 emission for China is probably much, much easier than before. China used to say that peaking of CO2 emission would be beyond 2035, about uh, five years ago. Now they are saying 25 years, uh, 2025, or well, not 2035, but 2025, maybe 2020. And 2020 is just IA is saying this 450 ppm scenario. And US is, thanks to the share revolution, United States is moving much more positively for target setting then. The issue is India. Japan, Korea, uh, Japan is problem in, if we don't have nuclear, of course, but um, Europe is okay. So the, as a major emitter, India is probably most difficult and solving the issue somehow, coal is a key for any success. Does anyone else want to come, on the, come in on this and then we'll open it up? Yeah, I, yeah go ahead. I, I, I agree that, that that is the issue and it's very, very hard to, to tell India not, not to use it and I think we shouldn't. Let me now put a, a little bit of a plug in for what we are trying to do with the air capture. We, we are trying to be, demonstrate that this technology is actually feasible. That's our goal at Arizona. The reason I went there is I, I do believe I have a real chance of building real hardware out in the desert, demonstrating that I can collect that CO2 over the next few years and get, and get it in a public way so you can kick the tires and you know yourself that it will cost what I say it will cost them and not, not any other number and show how we can make progress. If you can do that, you can start negotiating about who owes what carbon because you can now tell India, okay, in net total per capita, you haven't really emitted all that much. And we can take a little larger share on our side and take it back because we can effectively cancel out your emissions. Right. So you, you can start playing games like that because you say it is not irreversible that the CO2 actually hit the atmosphere. You can, you can fix that problem and we can <coughs> negotiate that in some form or another. Now having said that, I would still argue in the long run it is cheaper to collect that CO2 at the power plant in India and pretty soon if we have decided to do that service, we'll say, you know what? It would be actually much smarter if we move right into your power plant and fix the problem right there. Mm -hmm. But the simple ability that you get from having the flexibility of having such tools, you can actually make things work. And I think we, we have no choice but to give poor countries a chance to develop. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we don't do that, uh, it's not just about the environment. It's also about the, the access to energy. And we, we have to work, walk this fine balance. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to uh, add a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, I mean, one is um, uh, 
you know, predictions about the future, um, especially having anything to do with energy, are just notoriously um, wrong. Um, so, uh, you know, you'll look at the IEA uh, baseline projections going out to 2050, and still, you know, huge populations in 2050 with no access to modern energy. Um, well, fine, you know, uh, what you think BAU looks like is sort of in the eye of the beholder. But I think what's more troubling is that when you start looking at the mitigation scenario, scenarios, the mitigation scenarios assume about a billion people still without access to modern energy in 2050. And mitigation scenarios should be normative. They should describe the world that we want to live, you know, the future that we want, and how to live there. And so one thing I'll say is that it's just sort of unconscionable in some way that, that um, those mitigation scenarios still leave a billion people uh, or more without access to modern energy in 2050. Um, and uh, there's a reason for it, um, which is that if you actually have more, uh, let's say, uh, I think, frankly, uh, um, justifiable uh, uh, expectations mm -hmm. for the expansion of uh, you know, universal energy access in, in, in any way that anyone in this room would recognize the word, which is not just, you know, a solar panel and a couple of light bulbs to sort of uh, charge your cell phone for a couple of hours a day. Uh, no one here would recognize that as access to modern energy. But that's um, often how it's modeled today. Well, that when is you how it's modeled scenarios. today, yeah, exactly. That is the and first step for the what, 1.3 billion, right? Billion. Uh, you're not going to show up tomorrow and it, flip on two yeah. flat screen TVs. Fair, <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough, but, but when you really look at at, you know, the reason we care about it is because it's a really basic development imperative. Um, and if you actually really kind of have more realistic um, and higher assumptions about the, the sort of baseline acceptable level of energy consumption globally, mitigation gets a lot harder, um, which I would suggest is the reason that the mitigation scenarios um, uh, um, sort of uh, uh, assume such just pitiful levels of, of, uh, of what, uh, such a pitiful definition of energy access. So I think there is some good news there, you know, where, you know, much of the population that doesn't have access to, mo uh, to modern energy sources is in Africa. A lot of Africa doesn't have a lot of coal, but it's got a lot of gas, and it's got huge hydro resources. Um, and so I think, um, you know, there are pathways uh, to mitigation, if not to 450, um, uh, to sort of lower than BAU, uh, if we're serious about, uh, you know, working with uh, uh, emerging economies in Africa to really uh, uh, use those things. And it will require us to deal with some of the trade-offs, like in the Democratic Republic of Congo, they want to build the largest dam in the world with help from the Chinese and the South Africans. It's a 40 gigawatt dam, um, uh, basically 40 nuclear plants, um, which is key not only to sort of energy access, but to broader development imperatives um, uh, for economies that are just desperately poor right now. Um, and, and so I, I think there's another, uh, the energy access element of these debates is really critical, and I think we really need to get our heads around a path that, that um, also kind of is committed to, to truly meaningful levels of energy access for everyone on the planet um, as we deal with the climate challenges as well. I'll yeah, just, and I, I'll just ahead. add one quick thing, which is, I mean, maybe I see this in, in two black and white terms, but I mean, if if the development, if these development institutions are financed by, let's be clear, you know, our money uh, as Americans and other developed economies, and if we collectively are worried about climate change, I mean, what kind of what kind of world are we helping them develop into if we're funding coal plants that continue to contribute to the problem? I just don't, I don't. To me, it's actually fairly black and white. I don't think development finance should be funding coal. Well, just, I just, don't just think. I mean. I mean well, that, that's easy for us to say sitting here, but if, I mean, look, uh, the existential fear that everyone in this room has of like really, really catastrophic climate change is that we live, end up living like sub-Saharan Africans. Um, so if you're a sub-Saharan African, I think the reality is you'll take your chances with climate change to get some modern energy now. Um, and we can kind of say, well, our interest is in avoiding catastrophic climate change, so no coal for you, Africa. Um, but uh, I, think that's, uh, I, I think that's a really uh, both sort of dangerous and narrow way. Because for instance, you know, the Chinese just announced their own development bank, and I guarantee you um, that uh, they will be putting no such restrictions on, um, 
uh, the infrastructure that they're prepared to finance in, in, in Africa and elsewhere in the world. And so I think we actually have to start dealing with, we have to deal with that world as it is and with what its needs are uh, now. And in that context, I think we need to think about how we can at least uh, 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 sort of accelerate the move towards a lower carbon um, future there, if not a zero carbon uh, future as fast as we might like. Yeah, I, I think in the <clears throat> IEA's modeling of the uh, modern energy access for all scenario, you know, emissions are about 0.6% higher. Now, partly that's because it's so low in what they're modeling, but it raises the question, uh, we don't need to get into this debate now, about, you know, when you say it's pretty black and white, like, what, there's a trade-off in terms of energy access and economic growth and what the actual impact is and where the actual emissions are coming from, and I presume it also depends, has to depend on what the alternatives are, right? I mean, how costly are the alternatives? What are they? And if you were to impose a rather high carbon price, and that still is the most economic alternative, I could see someone making an argument on the other side. You could disagree, but there is an argument there somewhere. It may not be totally black and white. Yeah, I mean, I would agree, but to some point, I mean, I also <coughs> be clear, like, there, I still maintain that in a number of countries around the world, the next megawatt you could add from the economic perspective, from the affordability perspective, could be a clean one. It yeah, doesn't right, have to be right, that's right. this default assumption that it has to be a dirty one to be the cheapest. No, 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 I no, totally disagree with. I don't think anyone is suggesting that. But you wanted to say something, Klaus, and then we, we should open it up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, we, 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 went, we went into a slightly different direction. But I, I, I do believe it's important that we give people access. And I, I recall in about 1996, I gave the same, same uh, sermon you just gave. And, I was right, because <laughs> we, we consume far more energy than we planned back then. We tend to lowball these numbers, and I think you will be right this time around, too. We, we, tend to, we tend to lowball it, and it's not that we pay poor people to make it happen. Uh, they end up doing it themselves. The last time around, it was China. Next time around, it's India, and right on their heels will come, come Africa. And, and it's, a, it's a good thing, and it will happen. And as long as they are still poor, I think we cannot stand here on our high horse and demand what they do. I still remember, I was very upset one day when I read in the New York Times when the little Tata came out. The New York Times basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, and it sharpened it a little, if they do that, we are doomed. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, because if, if everybody in India drives that little car, we with our big SUVs are doomed, right? <laughs> I, <laughs> and... And, and in, in, the, in the end, we have to give people a chance to grow and develop, develop and we, we have to help. And if we want to help, we can say, nothing prevents us from coming in and say, we'll, we'll pay the difference to making this plant clean, right? And, and yes, we, we should. Sorry, let's um, open it up. Please identify yourself and keep your questions brief, because I think there may be many, and we want to get as many in as possible up here and then over here. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, Ken Kramer at uh, Rushton Atlantic and a, a B-School alum as well. Um, a couple of things on CCS and nukes. If we get to affordable CCS on most new coal plants, I guess my questions are, how much industrial demand will there be for that carbon? Uh, will there, how much will be left over after industrial demand that's going to have to be shot into a hole in the ground? And are there any storage <laughs> alternatives like uh, solid carbonate crystals that uh, the gas can be put into? And on nukes, does the panel have any comment on either thorium reactors or some of the uh, aneutronic low-budget fusion technologies that are emerging as an uh, alternative to uh, you know, current fission technology with uranium? So what, and maybe what we'll do is we'll take small groups of questions two or three at a time and give people a chance to respond. So there was one over here. Paul Real, Paul Reale, Reale Consulting. So uh, as far as Africa goes, won't we be <coughs> leapfrogging? I'm getting what feels like a mixed message in terms of the technology. Won't we leapfrog the fossil fuel-based technologies and jump straight into the renewables uh, to, uh, to, in order to electrify these people? Thank you. And I'll add one more from Twitter, uh, which we really should have uh, talked about, is um, energy efficiency. And how does the potential for energy efficiency change the conversation we're having? How much impact can it have uh, in the short to medium term? Who wants to start? I will start with uh, <laughs> the nukes. <Yeah. laughs> 
Um, <coughs> the thorium reactor, yes, it is a, a very good feature of uh, proliferation free, I mean, the proliferation risk, uh, low risk of the proliferation, uh, because uh, it will not create plutonium. Um, but uh, certainly, I. <laughs> I'm wondering, is in the reactor or reactor system as a uh, whole has a certain you know, uh, feature which could fit to some country but not to the other. So depending on the situation or, uh, or historical development of the already the nuclear technology, some reactors may or may not fit for that. And thorium is very good for the country, which is really relatively new start of the nuclear with very rich resources of thorium. And India is a case. So for India, the thorium reactor is probably a very good idea. While for Japan, US, Europe, uh, Korea, those uh, heavy users of the light water reactor system, we need to solve the issue of uh, spent film and uh, reduce the spent fuel and reduce the high level waste uh, to the manageable uh, way. And for that purpose, I think uh, I, I think uh, integral fast reactor and pyroprocessing, which the United States has developed in the Argonne National Laboratory, is probably the best solution uh, as a system. High Temperature gas reactor, which is using helium as a coolant, is a very good idea for those who use heat as a uh, source. Using for the kind of uh, Middle East countries, using the heat for desalination, you know, this makes good sense because it's, it has a very good uh, safety or passive safety feature. So depending on the nature of the reactor system and the required uh, the country situation, the reactor should be uh, treated as such. Low budget fusion, yes, I visited uh, the company called General Fusion in Vancouver. Oh, I'm surprised. I thought it was a joke, but uh, when I saw the real equipment, they're, they're serious. And some of the venture capitalist investment in, invested in that. British Columbia government has put the money into it. So it could happen. They said in two years' time, if this is commercially and engineeringly possible or not, they will find. If it's done, if it is possible, really it makes a huge breakthrough. So who knows? Let's uh, we'll try to get as many uh, questions in as possible, so if people have brief answers to one or the other. I have a questions. brief answer on the, on the CCS story. Um, I say something that's probably politically incorrect. That carbon which you've mobilized in fossil fuel is ultimately a disposal issue uh, because there's way too much. In the US, we are producing about 20 tons of CO2 per person per year. Uh, the only thing we consume more of is water. Uh, so how many Greek revival columns can you put in front of your house? <laughs> because you have to put 20 tons of CO2, which is about 50 tons of calcium carbonate, <laughs> a year away per person. It's just not possible. Uh, how, many, so, how many columns is that? <laughs> I would say probably five columns per, <laughs> per year per person living in a household. So. so <laughs> So it, it, it is just too much. So I would argue if you, if you stay, stay on, on that trajectory, you have to be large scale into disposal, which is not to say that there is not a commercial market for CO2. To give you a feeling in the US, we are consuming, if I recall it right, 8 million tons of CO2, which I would call merchant CO2 stuff, which runs around on a truck and gets delivered. Some 40 million goes into urea, which is right next to the refinery, so it never saw the street. And lastly, you have some 40 million tons in enhanced oil recovery. By comparison with 5,700 tons we are emitting to the air. So <laughs> so million tons we are uh, emitting to the air. So there's just no comparison. So yes, you can learn your way down that curve by starting in these niches. But ultimately, you are in the disposal business. And to come to your last question, <laughs> <laughs> I should pay you a cup of coffee at the end because I started the idea of making mineral carbonates in the in the 90s and I still think this is in the long run a very good idea. It got into the IPCC report because I, I uh, on a special report because I uh, had started this five, six, uh, about 10 years earlier. Uh, it is still too expensive, uh, but I think it could be the ultimate unlimited disposal source 
uh, a sink where you can put all that CO2, but we are far from having made that commercially viable. Um, Ethan, do you have a comment on Just efficiency? real quick on CCS, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know anybody wants to live near a CO2 sink. And so to me, not being a scientist, that's just a pure NIMBY issue. I, I feel like that's always going to be a challenge. We were chatting about this beforehand, though. You know, One of the ideas of people taking CO2 and finding ways to convert it to some kind of a biofuel. And if you can do that, then you're actually, and then you could, you could potentially be displacing use of gasoline. Yes. That's a source. But I think something other than simply yeah. trying to find a place to put it underground, I, my personal view is that I don't think that's the long run sort of winning the, strategy. The only problem I have is that we are probably committed to 1,500 gigatons of this already yeah. because we, we have to come back. Right now, if it's air capture, I can be in Alice Springs in Australia, yeah. where the pop popular <laughs> complaints will be a little lower, simply because there are not that many people. But but the the bottom line is, we probably have more CO2 to put away already than we emitted in the 20th century. I, I'll just uh, respond to a couple things on the on the question of the grid in Africa. I mean, I, I think one uh, we we put out a report uh, this. Uh, spring called High Energy Planet um, that uh, really looked at the energy access question. And uh, just one of the points it made, and I'll, I'll make again here, is just that um, the, I think the mental model for electrifying Africa remains like, especially if it's like a renewables future, it's like a, it's like a, a solar panel on a thatched hut in some little village. And I think the thing you have to realize about Africa is like every place else in the world, Africa is urbanizing really, really quickly. Um, uh, so uh, if you sort of are, say, Africa leapfrogging to a heavy renewable future, then you have got to have a plan for how your renewables are going to run mega African cities, because that's where the continent is going. Um, and uh, that means you obviously need to, uh, you know, be, first of all, one, this idea that it's going to be this heavily decentralized, you know, uh, 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 that doesn't work nearly as well in cities. Um, and uh, it's going to be, if you're going to run big cities on renewables, it's going to be big renewables farms, whether it's wind or solar uh, or something else. Uh, and obviously, you're going to have to deal with the intermittency uh, issues. Um, uh, so uh, without kind of getting into, well, is it renewable? Is it something else? Obviously, renewables are going to play a role. I think a lot of other things, whether it's fossil or hydro, um, um, are going to play a big role. Um, but, uh, but just realize that Africa is not that National Geographic picture of, uh, of uh, the, you know, the, the thatched hut villages. It's urban. It's urbanizing really fast. Parts of Africa have been growing at like 10 percent annual growth, like Chinese level growth rates for most of the last century. So um, uh, I, I think it's unlikely that that's a future that's going to uh, evolve without a grid, for instance. Um, uh, on the efficiency question, um, uh, I think efficiency is really, really important just generally as an economic good and also as a climate mitigation tool. I do not think it is the first fuel. I do not think that um, we have to just stop thinking that efficiency is like this one for one, like you kind of get a better light bulb and you shut down a power plant because plant, it doesn't work that way. Um, and uh, I think there are a bunch of reasons uh, to think that uh, even with much faster uh, improvements in technical efficiency, uh, energy demand for all the reasons we've talked about already is going to continue to grow uh, very, very uh, rapidly. That said, I think efficiency changes the way energy systems work in ways for a variety of reasons that make them more amenable to moving to cleaner energy supplies. And I won't go into all those reasons now, but I think there's a less uh, sort of linear way of thinking about the role that efficiency plays. But you, <clears throat> what I think you're not going to get is like these mitigation scenarios we see in, at, from the IEA and, and most other mitigation scenarios, which are like 40% of your mitigation is going to come from uh, technical improvements in the energy efficiency of various technologies. I, I, I think there's a bunch of reasons to think that's highly unlikely. 
So let's get um, well, three can more I, questions. Can I just jump in on Africa for one quick second? Unfortunately, we're, we're, Ted, Ted, Ted is really set, fast because just, just got to get more uh, questions. He set me up to defend the National Geographic perception of Africa, but I will say this, which is that yeah, there's urbanization happening, but when you have countries with 75 percent of the population that has no access to electricity, we should not ignore these very basic challenges of just getting people some and to simply supplant the burning of, of, of a diesel generator or, or, or animal waste. These are dangerous. These are uh, you know these are harmful things and these are things we can do right now. The other thing I would say is that there's something in between the one panel on a thatch hut and dealing with the city, which is which are mini grids in villages of a, you know a few hundred people. And there's a lot of that kind of activity that's starting to take place. Places like Tanzania, Uganda, others where that's starting to take take place. And that's somewhere in between. I think what the two worlds that Ted and I have just sort of laid. And I, I would just no, argue no, that no, those things stopping. will accelerate We're urbanization. Actually. We're going to uh, get three more questions in really fast, and then three more answers really fast, and how fast they're able to determine whether these are the last questions. Um, right here uh, first. I'm Herb you know, microphone. Uh, I'm Herb Rubenstein, the University of Colorado Denver's Global Energy Management Program. And the question is, should governments together internationally begin to try to invest more, like ARPA-E, our defense, our you know, version of the Department of Energy, should governments, Russia, US, other countries come together with Japan and others to invest together in research and development for new technologies, or is that impossible? Um, the woman on the aisle in the black. Hi, um, my name's Joanne. I'm from the law school. Um, I've got a question. Uh, the panel touched on solar and the <coughs> issues of inter um, inter intermittency with solar. I'm just wondering what the panel's thoughts are on the idea of battery. And then in the back here, gentleman in the blazer. I'd like a little more respect for uh, uh, energy efficiency. I mean, it's population <laughs> times average use gives you your total energy you know, demand. Um, and, and especially if you're getting the, the mega cities built now, I mean, there's a capital cycle, cycle. Once those things are built, those buildings are there for 100 years, and it's harder to make improvements, efficiency improvements in those buildings. So, uh, you know, plus, the, anyway, I just think there's an awful lot more that we could do there. And, and well, that's, I said it. Okay. Good. Well, that was a comment, not a question, so we'll do one more question then. Oh, the, <laughs> the, no, no, the, it's okay. We have a lot of questions. Um, right here, uh, yeah, on the, yeah. Uh, Jack Love from Georgetown University. I had a question when um, kind of following up on the, how to advance, how to push along technological progresses, whether market, uh, market or regulation. Um, I was wondering, open to anyone, if you could see the DOE or the U.S. government expanding on or uh, setting up new investment programs, what would you like to see in your ideal world? Okay, so um, unfortunately these probably are the final questions, but let me ask everyone to just take like 90 seconds and respond and, and any concluding thoughts? I, I can pick up on the batteries briefly. <clears throat> My view is batteries are expensive and will always be on the expensive end. They are very good for short-term storage. If you're starting to talk days, weeks, seasons you need to store chemically and that's why i'm so interested of taking co2 and water back to fuel and that can be done the efficiency of that round trip is is very low but the cost of storing sitting on a can of gasoline for a year is practically zero so you can afford holding it a long time whereas a battery costs you a penny an hour to operate at a kilowatt story kilowatt hour storage uh, gosh, I don't know where to start. I, I, I'm a little more optimistic about batteries, actually. Um, we've seen um, really rapid declines in the price uh, per kilowatt hour of batteries in the last couple of years, not because of necessarily because of government <coughs> R&D, although certainly government has driven this phenomenon, which is that basically the auto industry anticipated selling a lot more electric vehicles than it has, uh, they, and thus a lot more uh, lithium-ion battery capacity was built that was needed, and thus the price of lithium-ion batteries has been dropping like a rock, and now Tesla's going to build some giant new plant out west as well, which is going to continue to put price, price pressure on lithium-ion batteries. So that's one small potential solution, but not a perfect one, and I completely agree with Klaus that there's, there's a limit there. Um, in terms of countries coming together, that's too big a question for me to try to answer right now, although they say that I don't think Russia is going to be much help. Um, and I'll give it to Ted. Yeah, uh, um, that's a, just a, a um, pitch, uh, another report, but um, we, have a, we have a report coming out shortly, which is a follow-up to this High Energy Planet report called High Energy Innovation, 
um, which sort of really makes the point that we were making earlier that um, the way that we think about how low carbon innovation is going to happen, it's going to happen where the uh, energy systems are being built. But we've started actually mapping a lot of the international collaboration that's already happening, uh, really looking at, at sort of four different technologies, nuclear, CCS, uh, gas, and uh, uh, shale, shale gas, and um, uh, uh, solar. Um, and, and so there's already an enormous amount of kind of collaborative research and collaborative development and deployment going on. <laughs> And um, without having an answer, I think we should want more of that. And I think one thing, uh, but I don't think we actually have a very good framework for sort of how to do it and how to do it well, um, uh, and sort of how to do it in ways where um, it makes sense for the various political economies involved. Um, you know, I uh, one of my regrets in my la in the last ten years is that we sort of uh, in our enthusiasm for big public investment in uh, renewable sort of helped launch this meme that there was this clean energy competition and race between the US and China. And I think that was wrong, um, both because uh, if, uh, if anyone's going to win that race, it's not going to be the United States. Um, and second, because I think that uh, actually the benefits of accelerating Chinese innovation the real benefits from, from energy technology innovation technologically come from not like who has more manufacturing jobs making solar panels. It comes from having access to really cheap, clean energy. If you look at long-term drivers of growth, the sort of technological <clears throat> change associated, you know, every, almost most economists, neoclassical and otherwise, agree that technological change in one form or another has been arguably the largest driver of long-term economic growth. Um, and when you really go look at the key <coughs> technologies that have driven that, they are often also the technologies that have driven energy transition, steam engine, internal combustion engine, all sorts of technologies that are both energy technologies and just more broadly productivity enhancing technologies. So uh, I think, you know, it, for instance, it is in the U.S.'s interest to help China, China become a, you know, ener clean energy manufacturing and production powerhouse because ultimately even if we end up buying those technologies back from the Chinese, if they're cheap enough to scale in China, it's going to be an economic boon here. Just look at the benefits from having cheap shale gas and shale oil over the last six or seven years in the U.S. That dwarfs, you know, any renaissance associated with, like, making more solar panels is likely... Uh, domestically is likely to bring. So, so I think there's a, a different framework both economically and at the international level uh, in terms of these sort of various climate negotiations for collaborative uh, innovation investments that uh, I think uh, needs to be better refined and, and articulated. Klaus, 30 seconds, and then uh, yeah. Lubo, you can wrap up let, and summarize what we've heard let me sort tell of us what my, insights we should take away. Yeah, let me give me my personal wrap-up and tie it with the energy efficiency argument. I think energy efficiency is very important. Energy efficiency will be driven by economic drivers because nobody wants to waste energy. It is not in your advantage to do so. Uh, and so, and it's good to even promote it with, with government policies. But, and here's my but, and this is where I'm working on something else in effect, you can drive emissions down by a factor two. You can drive demand down by a factor two. But you cannot get to zero in the emissions. And you certainly cannot get negative. So it's not an either or. We should do one or the other. We will do both. But I'm less concerned that energy efficiency will not happen by itself. Energy intensity has been dropping by one to two percent consistently over decades. So I think this will happen. Uh, but we need to get the emissions of carbon down to zero and below. And that requires new and revolutionary approaches. And that's why I do what I'm doing. Yeah, let me, yeah, I cannot agree more. Yes, Klaus, it's right. Energy efficiency is important, but just as you say, that is the truth. One point about the battery or storage of electricity, Japan is very much serious now back to the hydrogen economy. Uh, because the uh, U.S. is thankfully exporting LNG of the shale gas in the future, but still the cost is more than double of the U.S. price. So for the sake of Japan, using uh, uh, gas or liquid natural gas is not really a competitive solution. So rather uh, exporting, uh, importing gas as LNG, but just get only hydrogen and burn it in the power sector, or 
use it in the fuel cell vehicle, like Toyota is starting selling it uh, to the end of the year. And, and this hydrogen economy could uh, happen by the technology like uh, uh, methyl cyclic and it's a chemical hydrate method which is now developed by the Toyota engineering. And storage and uh, transportation can be done just like oil. So this is a very cheap way of storing electricity in the future. So uh, innovation in, in, is very, very important. And international collaboration, just somebody said about, uh, is important. We learned a lot of lessons and mistakes. ITA is, is a huge uh, fusion, uh, international collaboration. So we should do, but also it may have some problems. So we, have, we learn a lot. And uh, for the nuclear uh, issue, like uh, integral fast reactor, I'm proposing to do it in the Fukushima Daini, the second uh, nuclear power plant of testing this uh, IFR, a prism reactor of Hitachi with uh, pyroprocessing to solve the issue of debris. The huge decontamination or decommissioning issue of Fukushima can be tested and demonstrated with this new technology as international collaboration between US, Japan, and maybe Korea, because Korea is very eager to do this kind of technology. So international uh, collaboration is certainly a very, very important. And I think this kind of discussion gives us the need and focal point of of where we should uh, do in the energy sector and nexus. So yes, difficult thing is difficult. We have to tell the people uh, what the option and the cost at the same time. And then let our policy makers uh, not to make mistakes or not to repeat the mistakes we did before. That is my uh, suggestion. Thank well, you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you to our uh, panelists, and, and especially to Tanaka-san for uh, your um, joining us. You're coming from Tokyo, spending time in residence, and, and helping the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia. So please join me in thanking everyone. Thank you.